coming up next, Beverly Silver, a professor in the Department of Sociology at the Johns Hopkins University. She examines the limits and legitimacy of profits and how readjustments to legitimize capitalism will inevitably lead to another round of crisis. Where capital goes, crisis will follow, says Beverly Silver. The way I um, have uh, found useful to conceptualize uh, historical capitalism is it's at being uh, characterized by a fundamental contradiction between the drive to maintain profits and the drive to maintain a minimum amount of legitimacy so that there's a, a, social a sufficient social cohesion to, re to derive profits and stability to derive profits. And so if the system gets pushed too far in the direction of, uh, of uh, essentially giving the kinds of uh, benefits necessary to win the cooperation of the population and, and uh, and, and that we end up with a crisis of profitability, but the crisis of profitability in turn brings, uh, brings about measures that, like neoliberalism, like the kind of neoliberal policies that we know, you know from the 80s and 90s and up to the present, that then um, create problems of legitimacy. So um, if we look, what I, what I see in, is looking at uh, the 1870s and 1970s, that those were crises of a falling rate of profit where there was intense competition and that the, it was solved by redistributing uh, income toward capital. Hmm? And if you look at the crisis of the 1930s, it was resolved through a redistribution of income toward labor. And it seems to me that the solution to this crisis involves a redistribution toward labor. And so, you know, again, so we, we, uh, and um, if they follow, if they, even from the, their the own interests of the elite, if they follow a policy of trying to reestablish neoliberalism, what I see is a, a deepening of the depression, a second round of collapse. And, and it's a bit worrying because if the collapse happens, you know, uh, with um, essentially, you know, looking at, at Obama rather than Hoover in, right, then the, the political dynamics of that are uh, very worrying. In other words, if we have the crisis of legitimacy fell on Hoover, and therefore it had a whole, whole different kind of unfolding. If the crisis of legitimacy falls heavy on Obama because he, in fact, he and, and then Canadians, Europeans, and follow policies that are attempt to actually restart neoliberalism in disguise, then I, I think it's extremely uh, worrying if that is indeed what, what's happening uh, and, uh, and, and something that we should both be mobilized against because it's just morally wrong to be redistributing. There's already enough inequality to be making things further, you know, further pushing inequality. And it's also uh, extremely dangerous in terms of the political implications of when another collapse comes or the other shoe falls or whatever, if it falls in an allegedly progressive, you know, political uh, administration. So, so we can see over the 20th century that everywhere that uh, it, mass production capital has gone everywhere, maybe an overstatement, but most places, that um, within a generation, often capital will move to places where there's cheap or control over labor and authoritarian state within a generation. You often get very strong labor movements. So we had, you know, we see, saw this in South Africa uh, in the 70s that the labor movement was that capital went to South Africa because of cheap and controllable labor under apartheid, and that we get uh, uh, emergence of a mass production proletariat that's, a cent that's central to uh, both this labor movement and anti uh, play a central role in the anti-apartheid movement. We see it in South Korea. We see it in Brazil. Um, we see it in, uh, in, a, in a strange and different way I can't get into in Poland with, you know, with the industrialization in Poland. But, um, and so if you follow this where capital goes, conflict goes, we see that 
uh, well, where has capital been going massively uh, over the last decade or two? It's been to China. And in fact, if, since the late 1990s in China, we've been seeing growing grassroots labor unrest. It hasn't been taken the form of you know, uh, organized uh, independent trade unions and new independent political parties, but it's been uh, massive enough in its grassroots effects that it's actually pushed the government, the Chinese government, to try and institute certain kinds of reforms. And here we have a parallel between what's happening in China now and what happened in, in the 1930s, you know, in terms of the kinds of labor legislations that were passed. And so, and, and it matters, of course, what happens in China, because uh, it's a billion people, it matters, and it matters uh, also in terms of the weight <coughs> that China has in the world, in terms of effect, indirect effects, et cetera. You know, that, that there's a problem in the U.S., and I think it's a problem more generally in the West, of, the, of, of an attachment to high status. In the case of the U.S., it's number one. In the case of the West, it's kind of a collective one, you know. And, and there needs to be a, a cultural revolution. We need to start thinking in terms of cultural revolution as activists and as educators, um, where we can say, okay, this, uh, this, these kinds of adjustments, which could be interpreted as decline, relative decline, whatever, the, these kinds of adjustments actually do not mean that there's going to be a decline in the standard of living and welfare of the majority of people. In fact, there may be an improvement in the uh, uh, welfare of the majority of people once there's a reallocation of priorities away from this uh, growing and crazy militarism and uh, readjustment also in economic priorities away from profitability and toward putting livelihood first. And your daughters and your sons.